Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Stephen Napolitano, First American Title Insurance Company, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling, Urban American, The Wickoff Group. <laughs> So here we are, it's 2011, and you know, there, there's really questions of how great is the real estate market today? You know, where, where are we going? So today I've really twisted it a little bit. I've changed the format, and I've decided to bring four young individuals who have recently, over the last, let's say, five, 10 years, entered the real estate business to provide their insights on what's happening in the real estate market. My guests today include Britton Youngblood, who is the Director of Strategic Advisory Services for Newmark Knight Frank. Michael Adamo, who is an associate at the Briarwood Organization. Brooke Chanfiki, who is the Vice President and Team Leader at m and Bank. And last but not least, a returnee, Ben Levine, who is a Vice President and a Project Manager at Douglaston Development. So we have people from, we have an interesting, besides the fact they're all young, we have somebody who grew up in Alabama, somebody from Long Island, somebody from Buffalo, and we have no idea where you grew up, but we know where the family <laughs> roots were in Brooklyn. So how do, you, how do you see the real estate market, especially in your role of strategic advisory services? What do you see today happening? I think there is a, I mean, especially coming from Alabama uh, and having family that's actually involved in the real estate down there, there's a major bifurcation in the market. There is a major uh, disconnect between what's happening in New York City, Washington, D.C., other supply constrained markets, and then what's happening in the rest of the country. Um, the, the, the leverage is back, liquidity is back, capital is cheap, and it's competing for core assets in, in major markets. But I think the rest of the country is... Um, in, a, in a very different spot. And how, you know, as you said, your, your, your parents and family are in Alabama and your father's in real estate there. What type of real estate is he in and what does he see the market? He, he owns um, different things. He owns some retail, some, some industrial, uh, mostly retail. And how is the retail? Pretty rough. I mean, it's been, uh, particularly the panhandle, Florida has uh, not exactly been a uh, uh, a winning market lately, I think, compounded by natural disasters like Katrina, followed by things like the oil spill that killed uh, local tourism. Um, and then, you know, the market, the, the larger macro uh, economics at play that affected the whole country, I think it's been pretty hard, pretty hard hit. So let's go to the banker, who at one time was studying to be a physicist. Yep, that's so, correct. Um, you work for M&T, great people, great institution. Um, 
who is headquartered in Buffalo, where you were growing up. How do you see the market as a banker today uh, with regard to uh, our region, lending, competition, and what's happening? I see there being a lot of opportunity in our region today. Um, we saw in late 2010 a real, um, a real push. There was a lot of money that had been on the sidelines throughout 2009, 2010, was looking to be put to work in new acquisition opportunities, new development opportunities, which we as an institution provided that the, uh, the group behind it has a lot of experience, a lot of wherewithal are interested in doing. Um, we see there being a lot of opportunity this year, uh, a lot of new development opportunity, a lot of opportunity for uh, repositioning of buildings, uh, renovation opportunities for properties. Um, all in all, it, it looks to be a good year. So here we have you. You know, you've grown up in the, in the real estate business. You've been involved with two projects, which right now, the OM, which is completely rented on the far west side or the Highline area, I, you know, I, call I must call it the Chelsea. far west side, West Chelsea, the Highline area, and then the chic neighborhood known as Williamsburg with the edge. So where do you see, you know, you went into this business truly from birth, but after birth, I mean, you went into the business, you graduated Wharton, and then you worked for CS, and then you saw the world change. So how do you see the world today as compared to 2007? I think things are starting to come back. I think they're coming back slowly. But I mean, you just told me you had 18 sales at the edge, which is great. In the last 10 days, which is fantastic. In the last five weeks, we've had six sales over a million dollars, two of which were over two million. Um, on average, the last five weekends, we've had just about 40 people a day. I mean, I think that on the, on the buyer side and the renter side that the ground has settled and people are a little bit more confident. Um, on the development side, we're really starting to seriously look at new projects again, and I think we're starting to see where things are going to shake out. But at the same time, unless you're willing to do a 50% construction loan with 50% equity, it might be a little bit longer. Are you trying to negotiate a construction loan? He might with, be. With, with the I, young I, I lady over here. We already talked. <laughs> are we trying to do some negotiation? You remember there's the broker of record over here. Mm. So, so he, here's the question. Michael, you're with a company which... I've done the life story of Vinnie Rizzo, which was originally called Luigi Rizzo and Son, AKA the Briarwood organization, who is involved with residential apartments, a lot of affordable, and if you can, market rate. Right. How does the Briarwood and you see the world today? We see um, you know, opportunities and development starting to prosper a little bit. We're getting more conversations from lending institutions to entertain the idea of taking on new projects. Um, we're working in pre-development on a project up in the Bronx, 260 units of low, moderate, and senior housing. Um, we think that you know 2011 will bring you know more prosperous opportunities as land values come down in certain areas and. Um, that's a good point, now, they, because we can play with that in two manners. Land values in the Bronx have come down, but have land values come down in New York City from what you see? Because you've been looking at distressed assets and so have you, but the Bronx, land values have come down. I think, I think to, to Brooke's point earlier, there has been so much capital um, that has been shored up in, in, in expectation, anticipation of, of deep discounts um, and, and that capital is really eager and aggressive to, to be put out and, and be put to work. So I think early in the cycle, people were talking about a major disconnect between but, but, buyers and sellers. I, I think, Britain, I think the real question is, you know, when people say, I want to put money out, they say, I want to put money out in Manhattan. Maybe I want to put money out in Williamsburg. Mm -hmm. How many people say, I want to put out money in the Melrose section of the Bronx? You know, it's a, it's a different you know, different market. And I, and I think when we had the discussion prior to the show, which I'd like to, you know, encompass here, we talked about, as I, I've said, there's a new asset class. There's, you know, the, the asset classes are residential, retail, industrial, office, hospitality, and the new asset class is distressed debt, distressed assets, which you've been very involved. How do you see the distressed world today? I, well, I think in New York City, in particular, there hasn't there hasn't been a real distressed market to speak of. 
Um, the <laughs> debt has been back and liquidity is, is readily available and debt is pretty cheap. So I think that people are, that, that's continuing to push up asset prices. Um, I think when you, when you get outside of New York and Washington, D.C., there hasn't been the, the same aggressive pursuit of, of opportunities for debt and equity. And so I think that asset prices have, have sort of, they've obviously dipped, but they haven't dipped as, as deeply as they probably could um, and probably will when more deleveraging actually occurs. Ben? Uh, I think that there's, there's two different kinds of deals to, to talk about. I think that there's cash flowing deals and non-cash flowing deals or development deals. I think that because the government has kept interest rates so low that on cash flowing deals, there is capital that's readily available. I, I wouldn't say, you know, I, I think that there is liquidity. I wouldn't say it's the easiest thing in the world, but there, there's absolutely, if you have a cash flowing asset, there, there is an ability to get a loan on somewhat reasonable terms. On the other hand, if it's a non-cash flowing asset or, you know, a development deal, I think it's much more challenging to get that financing and, you know, to, to sort out that capital stack. Banker? There aren't as many, uh, hadn't been as many providers on the um, transitional or construction side for a, for a long period of time. Um, m and Bank was, you know, we took the tact of um, if you have a client, a really uh, well, you know, ingrained in the community client who has worked with m and for a long time and, and has a real relationship with the bank, um, that we will, will find a way to get behind that project, um, albeit on what we always used, which were very conservative metrics. Um, I think that some of the, the sales that we've seen, back to your, your, your point on the, the, the land side, there had been some real um, choice assets that had come to market in 2010, um, things that hadn't, you know, been seen on the market before, um, and so there were some real opportunities to to start taking a look at land and and bid up those prices for potential development sites, for you know, example. I recently, uh, I've I've done this on shows, I've done it also on symposiums. I brought up a very interesting question to bankers: How do you make the decision? on who's the new Rose family, or who's gonna be the next Resnick, who's gonna be the next Jimmy Kuhn. How do, you, how do you make the decision you wanna do business with Adamo or Britain? How do, you, how, do you, how do you sit there and make that decision? That's a really hard decision. That, for a bank, it's hard for a, a developer you know, to, to put their bucks, you know, somebody, there's a lot of money, and you say, oh, you meet this person, it's a dynamic person, but can that person develop that property? Can that person build that property in the Bronx or in Brooklyn or Long Island City? How, how, do, you, how do you look at it? It's a great question. It really comes down to, is that group doing what that group has the ability to do? So if someone, and I think it's probably the same in, in all of our you know, particular, uh, what is it we do on a day-to-day -day basis, if, if someone comes to m and Bank, for example, and um, in request of a hundred million dollar construction loan, they've never done a construction loan before in their life. That's a, <laughs> but, that's a very different but, story but, than. But I hate to say, huh. in two thousand and six, there was a, a lot a of money to chase a lot like of deals. Britain mm -hmm. or Mike or or Ben mm -hmm. would come to a bank and say, you know, I found this piece of land. It's in Williamsburg. I'm not saying like the edge. I'm talking about something mm -hmm. or it was in Brooklyn, and they'd say, you know, oh, you can have some money. And we'll let you build. And banks were out there. There was banks called Chorus. You know, there were other banks, you know, Fremont. There was a CMBS market there was a CMBS. as well. But mm -hmm. the, the idea is they would lend money to somebody. I remember I did a show a number of years ago on the Lower East Side, and I had this very nice guy. He says, I'm, I'm buying this building in Williamsburg. I'm going to convert it. I'm going to build this hotel. Uh, today he owns nothing. Now, some banks gave it to him. He was a nice young guy, mm -hmm. but he really didn't have that experience to do things. The person you work with, who I've known for years, Jimmy Kuhn, you know, he's been around the cycle. So sometimes you can, you know, put you can you can put your money on that right person who you're gonna make that bet on. You know? I think there were plenty of people that made a lot of money um, and became <coughs> the, the big wigs of the industry. Um, and I think it became very popular to do business with them. And they did prove themselves over a period of time of making a lot of money, but I think they were also riding an, an up cycle. 
And uh, I think that there are plenty of people that have had an established track record and reputation that have been, it, although not probably as decimated as they as they probably should have been based on the the, the cash flowing value of their of their assets because of but the, the lack know, of deleveraging. But you know, it's an interesting thing. Uh, Ben's father, Jeff, <coughs> and Vinny, and other people. You know, some of the most successful new developers who are in their 50s today started in the affordable housing business. Right. And mm -hmm. when I asked them the question, and I'll let you talk in one second, when I asked them the question of why do you go into the affordable housing business, they all gave the same answer. It was a cheap way to get into the business. I didn't have to put up much money. I got the land for the, from the city for free. Mm -hmm. You know, we had subsidies from everyone else. It was a great way. You were going to yeah, say well, something, no, Ben. To your point, you know, back in... The 80s when you could buy a vacant building in the Bronx for a dollar and put it into the participating loan program with HPD and you could put in limited equity to, to develop your first or your first number of projects that worked um, to go back to you know before the crisis I think that it was all about risk and where it was placed and it was very easy for lenders to lend when they could move risk around you know they could keep the pieces that they wanted and sell off the pieces that they didn't there were some people that sold the least risky pieces and kept the most risk because they believed that you know rent was going to grow at 5% a year for the next 10 years. To that point, I think that in the new market, and fortunately I was at your symposium, so it was like a cheat sheet uh, for today. I, I think that in the new market, if someone wants to do a deal, they either need to partner up or they need to be willing to start with a smaller deal and they need to be willing to put up equity or to sign the guarantee or, you know, the they're not going to necessarily get the kind of deal that a more established developer would want to take, but if you want to be in the business, that's what you have to do. You don't get rewarded without taking the risk. So we were talking before the show about different type of asset classes, which I just put out there are six. What is the one that each one likes better, Michael? I would have to say multifamily, and I think that that's kind of proven throughout the downturn to be the stable asset class. Um, you know, leases turn over year over year and reset with the marketplace, so it's, it, it adjusts more uh, quickly to the market. Britain? I would absolutely say rental, multifamily. Um, I think it's, you'd probably say the easiest to finance, and, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a need for it. And which ones do you think is the toughest? Which is the one that you would be very cautious to stay away from? Oh. Ben? <laughs> In theory, I think the condominium market is probably one of the riskiest. I mean, that I know that hotels, which you have to rent every day, are supposed to be the riskiest, but in today's economy, they're the easiest to finance because then they can catch the I upside. Think, I think they're easier to finance if it's an established developer mm -hmm. who has lots of equity in a good location. If somebody came to you and said, I want to open up a hotel near Yankee Stadium where I'm going to get some seasonal business, I don't think that the banks are going to do it. I think it's, it's, it's location-centric and so on. I can't believe that, you know, today it's easier to finance a new construction hotel than it is to finance a new construction rental if it isn't in age let, of 20. Let, let's ask the banker. I, I wouldn't say that one is easier than the other. Excuse me, what I would say is that it really, the story depends so much the the equity that's coming in whether or not the individual or group that's developing it is an established group with a lot of experience hotels were, were a tough market segment for for quite some time just given the they overall were the first occupancy. to go bad and the first very to dirty return. word it was very no was one would tough. talk about it it was very very tough it, and and but for that if you're working with the right groups of people that's what it, you know we always you, keep coming back right to you know there, there's a business that I failed to say which really is asset also Restaurants. Mm. What do you think of the restaurant business? I've done a number of shows. I've had people on. Um, I, I I know we recently were um, leasing a did, did a lease, and it, it sure makes a big difference if if they're they're a credit mm -hmm. or they they have a, a a parent behind them. I think there are lots of mom and pop restaurants that have were certainly hit very very hard um, by the 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 cut in. Bankers bonuses. But, but you know what the interesting thing, you're 100% you're correct that the, the white tablecloth, as we would call them, were hurt by the bonuses. But you know who else was hurt? The TJFs. Oh, casual dining, absolutely. Casual mm -hmm. dining, um, 
<coughs> because we have a mutual friend over mm -hmm. here, the casual dining was hurt, and what they had to do in many of the casual dining was to try to figure out a way to get people in. So they had these programs, you know, mm -hmm. where you come in on Monday night football, you know, different incentives. Didn't you guys go into the restaurant business slightly? Yeah. A, a little bit, and I, I think that what I was going to say, first of all, is I think the statistic is either 90 or 95 percent of restaurants fail in their first year. You know, in a place like New York, to, to, to do a successful restaurant, it often costs a lot of money. You need to have a very strong management team. You need to have a very strong concept. Uh, a lot of things need to go right to be successful in the restaurant business. I mean, some of the best restaurateurs fail on some of their concepts, and frankly, they can fail on a lot of their concepts. Don't go to a bank for restaurant loan. <laughs> that I can tell you. It's not an Very easy tough. world. It's a tough world. What about retail? I mean, you know, you talk about the Bronx. Do you think you'd have some retail in this property over there? Well, I think. Well, yeah, there's going to be 30,000 approximately square feet of commercial space, and I think depending on the location, if it's close to uh, mass transit and there's a lot of you know, foot traffic nearby, I think Retail can do very well. See, I, but in reality, you know, we were talking before about Long Island City. And we mentioned that there was limited retail. There's no real supermarket. But so what has happened is certain of the landlords have taken the uh, incent in, ingenuity incentive of putting in tenants and giving, reducing the rent so they could have the amenity of having the supermarket there. Well, I mean, we did something similar on the west side. You know, with the OM, it was very important to us to... Are you telling me that there is no supermarket on 28th Street in the High Line? The, uh, come on, you don't need a supermarket. Uh, you got Fresh Direct. <laughs> no, <laughs> at, at the same time, just to, first of all, to go back, I think that w we talked about restaurants and retail from our perspective. But if you are a restaurateur or a retailer, if you could have had the opportunity to open up your business, you know, 18 months ago, the likelihood of your business being successful is much higher than if you open up your business now or in 18 months from now. It's much now. harder, I agree. Because yeah. So tell us what you did now. about retail on the, the home. We very aggressively sought to find, you know, a, 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 a market type tenant for what I'll call our prime space, which is our corner retail space on the corner of 30th and 11th. And the only reason I call it a prime space is because it connects to our lobby so uh, you know we have that so what ta how many square lobby. feet is it it's about 2700 square feet um, so what type of tenant is there um it is a you know it's a market type tenant i'll call it a it's somewhere in between a deli and a gourmet market um, they're open 24 hours a day with direct access to the building you know tenants come down in the middle of the night three or four in the morning if they're up to get you know if they need to get a, a drink or a sandwich, whatever it is, I mean, it's it, it really is. Did you subsidize the the tenant? You know, I mean, with rent, maybe. I mean, no, no you, you know, we worked with the tenant to help them at the beginning. I mean, we're we're, we're reasonable. We understand the kind of market <coughs> it is. And but you know, it, it's very interesting because I think that was a great idea. But today, you know, s especially if you walk around Manhattan. You've seen that the uh, the Duane Reeds, which used to be 4,000 square feet, are 16,000 square mm -hmm. feet. Approximately 4,000 of the square feet are being used now for food, but not, you know, where they have coffee, they have sushi, they have uh, prepared foods and all the rest. You know, I, I think that where we were, one of the things that we tried to do with the OM was to make people feel comfortable. Um, between the amenity package that we presented with the, the gym and the lounges and the outdoor space, both you know, right at the base of the High Line on the, on the fourth floor and on the roof, with the lobby space where we partnered with the Knitting Factory, with the shuttle service to and from Penn Station, and also having what we'll call a, you know, like a, gourmet, I hate to say gourmet grocer, but a gourmet market, we'll call it. I just think that people have become comfortable in the building. And you know, when you have an 80-20 in New York, it's very important to establish your legal rents in the first year. So in order to do that, it's not a secret. You know, all of the developers on the west side had to do it. We gave two months free on a 14-month lease. Now, we just started our re-rents. Are you getting the, the And rent? I'm, I'm going to tell you, you know, if, if you had a 14-month lease with a 2.5% you know, rent stave increase, if you go to 12, it's a 17.5% increase. So, so far, we've been doing just fine. You know, in the first month, we've gotten, I think, 75 Yeah, but, but I think what you're basically saying is what we all discussed before, that residential rental is the best market.
today in, in, in this world. So mm -hmm. if you took uh, my crystal apple, and um, you know, I once they once gave me this crystal apple, but we don't have the crystal apple today. If I if I looked at the crystal apple, where where do you see the end of two thousand and eleven? Where for yeah. which real estate for which market in in general for in general. real estate in general? I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be a, a stronger end than two thousand ten. Um, I think we see rates staying relatively where they are for at least the time being, which is going to continue to keep, excuse me, continue to keep uh, financing happening and continue to keep investments happening. Um, but all in all, it looks like it's going to pan out to be a, a stronger year. Michael? I would have to agree. I think 2011 is certainly going to be a more prosperous year than, than last. Last was a little bit of stagnant uh, as far as new developments and investment activity. I think it's prosperous if you're originating loans or if you're if you're trading buildings. Um, I, I I think that there is um, there isn't the fundamental growth hasn't really materialized um, either in any dramatic sense in terms of rates, rental rates or occupancy. I think that the way that companies you know companies have cut a lot of workers from 2008 until today. The GDP is almost practically where it was in 2008, but there are. 6.7 million fewer jobs. So companies are learning to be more efficient and to use space more effectively. And much I think more that's a, much more efficient. The first thing that major companies are looking at when they're going mm. into an office building now is is it, it's not it's not like it used to be. It's how do we how do we fit more workstations into this space? How do we share space? How do we share conference rooms? I, I don't know. I would argue that um, you can only cut back so far before you realize that, and within this year, there might be a shift where uh, um, institutions, companies in general realize that they've cut too far their workforce, and you can only operate with a bare-bones workforce for so long. I, I wish we could continue, but we have exceeded 30 minutes, and I'd like to thank all of my young real estate leaders for providing their insight. I'd like to thank Britain Youngblood, Michael Adamo, Brooke Cianfici, and last but not least, Ben Levine. See you next week. Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, all Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Stephen Napolitano, First American Title Insurance Company, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Sterling & Sterling, Urban American, The Wickhoff Group.